Hello, and welcome to SoCo Chat, a podcast where we will be discussing all things concerning the County of Sonoma. This is where you'll have a chance to hear directly from leaders within our county government, listen to in-depth discussions about critical issues facing our community, as well as hear a variety of tidbits, tales, and historic anecdotes about this wonderful place we call home. I'm your host, Paul Gullickson, Communications Manager for the County of Sonoma. Today, we're going to kick off the new year with an interview with Supervisor David Rabbit, who represents Second District, which covers much of the southern portion of Sonoma County. Supervisor Rabbit is the senior member of the Sonoma County Board of Supervising Supervisors, having been first elected in uh, November 2010. Do I have that right? Mm -hmm. After serving four years on the Petaluma City Council. I think I've known you all that time, by yeah, the way, yeah. you know, from my days at the editorial board of the Press Democrat. Anyway, David, thank you for joining us here on SoCo Chat, uh, and thank you for helping us break in our new studio here. Yeah, Paul, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it seems like only yesterday when I first uh, was elected <laughs> to office, and here I am now the senior member of the board. Uh, but congratulations on really uh, producing a great studio oh, thank you. Uh, here. I think it's something that we've needed and uh, the ability to be able to get these kind of podcasts and multimedia uh, things out to the public is, uh, I think, a great service. So thank you for that. Well, great. Well, we hope uh, we appreciate that. And we hope this serves as a, a platform to helping, uh, you know, t discuss and tell the commu community directly about some of the things that are going on here in the county. So yeah, for sure. So we appreciate you kicking us off. So, well, let's get let's uh, let's start off. I, I, I should introduce you as chair rabbit um, you could, because you were just elected last week as to serve as chair of the Board of Supervisors. Um, and as I believe, as I know, understand, it's your fourth time, right? Having been serving as chair as 2013, 2014 and 2019. Would you mind telling us uh, what are the primary roles of being chair of the Board of Supervisors? Well, for me, I think the most important role is to really just facilitate an efficient meeting and to make sure that all of my colleagues' voices are heard and we do it in a very orderly way and mm -hmm. um, and use our time effectively. Mm -hmm. Also, make sure that we use staff time effectively. And as you know, uh, board meetings can be an all-day affair mm -hmm. and lots of different people coming and going and uh, making sure that uh, the business of the county gets done just trying to do it in a very efficient manner. I think the other thing for me is to make sure that we really communicate clearly. Mm -hmm. So when a policy question comes forward, that we're all being heard and that we can all uh, express our opinions, that we can, can uh, consolidate or cons uh, around one uh, direction. And that direction to staff is really clear because sometimes, um, you know, I, I think we're all guilty of not necessarily giving the best direction to staff, but, but to make sure that we give staff that direction so they can go off and do the work that they need to do and we're not wasting anyone's time. I think lastly for me, I think it's important, having been around the county for a, a while now, is to really highlight the good work of the county. Mm -hmm. There's so much uh, just stellar work that happens. And, and, you know, right now it's a difficult time to be in government at any level. Uh, people are very demanding, as they should be. Um, but I think also it's important to kind of take that little higher level step up and get, you know, we're doing a lot of really good yeah, things. Yeah. There's yeah. always room for improvement and we right. can continue to push ourselves, but let's also recognize the, uh, the good work of our staff here in Sonoma County. Yeah. Well, well, well put. And we, and we hope to do some of that, you know, we, yeah. we want to talk about the good and the bad here and, right. and that's part of the role here yeah. of, of a SoCo chat. Well, we also know there's some ceremonial responsibilities. Some, you, you probably don't kiss many babies in this <laughs> day and age, but, but I understand you, for example, have been invited by the white house to meet first lady Joe Biden out on the tarmac at Sonoma County airport today. Yeah. So I'll be out at the, and, and I, I, I dress for you. Paul, you didn't but dress I, for I, me. I, I told my wife I dressed for the first lady and of course I meant her, yeah. uh, uh, not Jill, but uh, I, I will be at the airport today uh, representing the county, and I think that's an important role for the chair. Um, we all take turns being chair, and in any given year, it, it's a little extra work because you're committed to more uh, things yeah. uh, during the week. Uh, but I think it's an important thing to step up and make sure that you're representing the county. And by representing the county, it's not just the board, but the entire county uh, okay. of Sonoma. Well, there are also some challenges to the job. And the last time you served as chair, for example, was 2019, a year that started with a historic flood on the Russian River and ended with a massive Kincaid. I hate to remind you of this, no, I know. but uh, a massive Kincaid fire that threatened much of the county. And, the, and we ended up with a vacu widespread evacuations. I think we had more evacuations that year than any other previous year. Yeah. And that particular year, if you remember, it was because that was, I think, the first year that PG&E was really... Uh, doing the power shutoffs. Right. Yeah. So the concern was that if they had done a power shutoff at the same time the evacuations were ordered, we wouldn't get it out. Yeah. So the sheriff at that time, smartly so, yeah. um, evacuated an even larger area to make sure that we uh, 
landed on the side of safety. Um, you know, each one of the, and it, it's just a, how many disasters our county has been through has really shown the resiliency of the county as a whole. Uh, and the or, people step up, staff steps up, and just to get the job done. Um, but each one of those instances was unique. Um, and the circumstances and the challenges that we addressed were unique to those, uh, to each disaster. Um, and I think we've also, as unfortunately, have had so much experience that we've improved our uh, response mm -hmm. and, and preparation um, so much better. We have now have a Department of Emergency Services where before we it wasn't a separate entity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're really prepared for whatever nature has in hold of our uh, uh, throws at us. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that um, we've learned along the way. Um, we've dealt with those crises. And I think what's interesting in hindsight is that even those that are most skeptical of government really do rely on government when times get tough yeah. like that, when disaster strikes. And that's when government needs to step up. Yeah. And I believe that's when Sonoma County has stepped up and really grateful for all the great work of uh, staff uh, during each and every one of those disasters. Yeah. There has been so much uh, over the last five, six years, going back to 2017, obviously, where, where we have grown as a community and as a county. Um, are there anything about those experiences when you were board chair um, from 2019 that, that stood out to you about you, about the role and what, what you play, uh, you, you know, either as a chair or as a supervisor um, in sort of trying to bring the community together? Yeah, I think, that, um, you know, Thinking specifically about the fire fire situations, and and those were those were long days, although not as long for those who were on the fire line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I put that out there. Um, you know, we had early morning briefings, we had late evening uh, press conferences, but it was really being there to show support, mm -hmm. uh, to stay engaged, uh, to offer, make sure that things were coordinated, um, and to really uh, understand. You know, mutual aid is a wonderful thing. We know that in this county. Uh, the systems that we have in place do work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get it started, but once it gets going, mm -hmm. um, people come from all over to help, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful thing of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, um, again, each one of those was a unique uh, challenge, uh, which created opportunities for improvement, which mm -hmm. created opportunities to streamline those processes and be even better the next time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that... Uh, um, you know, the, the things that still in my mind, you know, that the, the first, the 17 fires, Tubbs fire was just a, you know, when we woke up in the morning and found mm -hmm. out what really had happened overnight was just devastating. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the way the community came together and what we had to do in order to rebuild, mm -hmm. uh, although painful, um, we all rolled up our sleeves and got to work and, and got it done. Yeah. I remember going to that uh, first Economic Outlook Conference. I think it was 2018. I can't remember, was it Jerry Nicholsburg or somebody came and yeah. said, look, if you look at the economic trajectory of areas that have had catastrophic events like this, the key thing for you to do is rebuild and rebuild quickly. Yeah. And and you were um, one of the key leaders in helping encourage and move that along. And, and so it's really... I mean, it's been painful, you know, five, six years. Uh, obviously, not just the fires, Kincaid, Wallbridge, Glass, but the pandemic, floods, all those things were, were came along as well. But it's remarkable how much our community has recovered since since 2017. Yeah. And I appreciate, you know, as an architect, I'm professionally, I'm an architect and architect still, um, and kind of real understand both sides of the counter, as it were, um, and just. Those things, especially if you're, you know, if you've suffered the uh, incredible loss of losing a home and all your personal possessions, mm -hmm. the last thing we want to do is to to further be an obstruction to you moving forward. Um, and I, and I, again, I'm very proud of the work that we've done <clears throat> through that period of time to really streamline those processes, make it as um, painless as possible. Yeah. It's still very painful, and mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, uh, for those who had suffered those losses because they had to deal with their own, whether it was their own insurance companies right. and, yeah. and everything else. But uh, I just wanted to make sure that the county wasn't going to be uh, a further hindrance. Yeah, yeah, good good point. Well, you noted um, after the vote last week for the, to, to make you chair that the, quote, the passing of the gavel is always a good time to look back, but also to look forward. And um, as we look forward to this coming year, are there particular goals you have in mind to accomplish? Given what you said before <laughs> regarding how many different uh, disasters that the county has had, and then the pandemic thrown on top of that, um, understanding, you know, uh, the burnout of mm -hmm. all of us really yeah. in staff and um, um, around the county, I 
truly wish for a very calm year going oh, forward. That would be great. And uh, while there's still a lot of work to be done, <clears throat> to do it in a uh, very uh, kind of strategic and organized way would be mm -hmm. ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, now I know I'm what I'm wishing for is probably a little bit naive because I know that there's going to be things thrown at us. I just hope that those things that are thrown at us are um, a little more manageable yeah. than a pandemic or a wildfire or a flood. Um, and so it's really just ha having a calm, productive year. And quite honestly, I think, you know, th there's a lot of work being done. And again, a lot of good work being done. And I think we just need to take a breath, mm -hmm. uh, catch up a little bit mm -hmm. um, and continue moving forward, always striving for improvement. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to focus on just the, the challenges, but we have one more that, that you step into office and uh, is already a big issue. It's on your plate. Um, and it's called the highly pathogenic avian influenza or HPIA, otherwise known as avian flu. This highly contagious strain has had a devastating impact on our egg belt here in Sonoma County, which is the core of your district. Um, more than 1.2 million birds, including chickens and ducks, have had to be destroyed. What are you hearing from egg farmers about how they're coping? Well, let me just say that, you know, it's devastating, obviously, um, to be able to, uh, to to lose basically your your yeah. your entire business overnight uh, by having the virus infect your flock. And uh, it, it's just uh, heartbreaking. Uh, these are family farms. And I think, uh, you know, one was a, a sixth ge generation farm. One is a fourth generation farm. Yeah. They've been around the county forever. And from the South County, you know, we take pride in being the poultry area, the dairy belt and the poultry area, right. both of which are obviously struggling right now. Dairy for the last so many years, losing some dairies along the way in the poultry industry, just being devastated by this. Yeah. That's about half the total birds in the county, but probably even more so in terms of uh, those that are egg laying mm. hens and, um, and the duck market uh, as well, uh, meat birds. Um, we've been working as much as we can. Uh, to help coordinate the response. And the county has been great, um, starting with uh, TPW and um, all the way down the line through environmental health and everything else, working with the state. And the state, I must say, has also uh, been really great. The yeah. CDFA, California yeah. Department of Food They've been and on top of this. Yeah. They've been on top of it. And uh, at, But at the end of the day, the response is one thing. It's the, the business losses for those companies yeah. that are not covered um, and that we really um, are looking for assistance, some yeah. sort of uh, help. What can we do? Again, making sure that the county is not going to be making things worse, but actually being proactive to make things better. And, uh, you know, we may not be able to save every job, but if we can make the landing a little softer, softer uh, going forward, and uh, you know, it's going to be months and months before those farms can repopulate and get the birds to the age, yeah. uh, for the hens at least, uh, to where they're actually being profitable laying eggs again. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of costs involved in, in getting there. Um, so, you know, my hearts go, I know those people personally. Uh, my kids went to school with the, yeah. with the kids that are working there, their families. Um, and it's just really heartbreaking to see that happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, so, um, and you, uh, the board jumped on this, uh, you declared a state of emergency on December 5th. Um, and and that provides some financial assistance or opportunities for these business, these uh, farmers as as well as their their workers and the and the uh, the, the ancillary businesses that depend on those those farms. Is I know you've been working on this. Is there any hope of getting some support? I mean, we've now have this outbreak. It's not just Sonoma County. There's like five different counties in the state, right? And yeah, and and yeah. it's and it's spreading. I mean, originally when you declared the state of emergency, there were just two farms and. Sonoma County. Now we're up to 10, I believe is the last count. Is, is there any hope of getting some support at the state level? Yeah, there's still hope. There's, I mean, there's I, support I don't, I don't, there, but not there's a big support, declaration. Yeah. I don't yeah. think a declaration is probably in the cards. Okay. Uh, I did talk to the um, State Department of uh, Agriculture, um, and partly because it's, it's, it's a small amount of people and businesses have impacted. But I think the other side of that, too, is that it's a, it's a significant um, local food source, mm -hmm. an important local food source, as well as an important to our economy. It's a $50 million uh, wow. hit on our economy here locally. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, th I think that we're still um, in conversations with the state to see if there's any additional help that could come our way. Uh, again, it's the initial response. There is some help um, through the state for the value of the bird to that point in life, although that's a national average, not mm -hmm taken into account the additional costs here in California. 
um, and there's uh, um, some assistance in, in the cleanup. What they're not, what there's not assistance in is the business losses, the amount of time that mm. you're down, um, sterilizing the entire farm, and then getting it repopulated, and then being up and operating again. And yeah. that's that gap yeah. that we're looking at because there's, you know, there's two, three hundred employees out there as well that are also wondering what their future holds. Right. And all through no fault of their own. Right. And in fact, you know, devastating because they, these are the animals that they raise and then they have to put them down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's a it's 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 a challenge. One of the first things our office did was to contact those other counties that were impacted to see if they would also uh, declare an emergency to put a little additional pressure oh, on the good. state. Um, but again, I think it's because it's such a small overall yeah. piece and that coupled with, of course, the state has its own financial right. difficulties and they're not really looking for looking for opportunities so we're to spend looking more for, money. We're looking for existing funding sources that can fit the category to move in that direction, whatever it may be. Um, and ideally to make sure that we also, again, are aiding as much as possible and advocating for our local economy and our producers yeah. here locally yeah. uh, and not working against them. Yeah. Well, I know one of the things you've been talking about, as you mentioned, you know, the ripple effects of this, that there are a lot of businesses that are impacted by this, not just the poultry farmers. There's the the feed stores. And I was f interested to find out that how many people depend on the fertilizer from some of these farms for their operations. Yeah, it's, you know, and, and this is and we're going to talk about this a little bit next <laughs> week at the economic perspective um, uh, that EDB puts yeah, on next Thursday. Uh -huh. uh, but, uh, you know, the. Um, Agriculture in Sonoma County is not just vineyards, mm -hmm. um, and I think that we all, again, down my way, the dairy belt, the dairies have, like I said, have been, um, you know, having struggling mm -hmm. uh, for quite some time. We've lost a lot of dairies. Once you sell the herd, you're never coming back. Mm -hmm. Part of that is, a, you know, honestly, is a succession. You know, the, the kids may not want to be farmers, dairy farmers going forward, and that's fair. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that also is this: the pricing structure of milk and milk products. Sonoma County, I think, has always been very uh, uh, innovative, our, our ag community, innovative in terms of doing value-added products, whether it was high-end cheese, uh, yogurts, um, and then, you know, organic milk. When conventional wasn't making it, people went to organic. And then there was a glut of organic milk. The price structure didn't keep up, and it made it that much more difficult again. Um, it's a combination of all these things. You throw in three years of drought. You throw in, honestly, a lot of well-intended but mm -hmm. onerous regulatory processes and different things like that that just add costs but aren't adding necessarily the value on the back end mm -hmm. uh, makes it really uh, a difficult thing. Poultry was um, certainly wasn't as huge as it once was where millions of eggs were being um, you know produced each and every day mm -hmm. in the South County. Now it's some hundreds of thousands, but even those um, has ceased because of this uh, outbreak with the avian flu. Yeah. Um, it, but to your point, you know, there's so many other businesses that are impacted by that. I talked to one um, feed uh, facility in Petaluma that could lose up to 60% of their business oh, with the loss of the uh, poultry farms. And, you know, they were hanging on. Um, and who knows what the future of that holds. So you lose the feed store. Will you get, you know, the, the industries back to the same extent that they were before? Probably not. I mean, there, there has to be the infrastructure to support the entire system. Mm -hmm. And it's it kind of that... Um, uh, imp, you know, that cumulative impact of uh, losing those things, making it more difficult, increasing costs, and it pushes things back out to the Central Valley instead of here in Sonoma County where there's a, you know, probably a, a you know, a, a greater uh, uh, access to those kind of uh, goods. Yeah. Well, it, you know, if there's a positive side, it may be that there. this is a, a painful reminder, if not an education, about how significant agriculture is to Sonoma County. I mean, we've got a lot of people living in the nine incorporated cities, but, you know, this is a huge impact. And, and, and then a lot of people don't realize, you know, during World War II, Petaluma was known as the egg capital of the world. We produced the largest number of eggs or something like that during yeah, that period of you know, time. Yeah, I'm a city kid, right? Yeah. So I grew up in San Francisco, moved uh, north uh, thereafter. But um, my mom grew up on a farm in Ireland, and it, they were self, you know, they had two cows, a pig, and a couple chickens, and just enough to feed the family um, and, and try to make a little money to um, put some clothes on their backs. Um, but I think that, um, you know, really what we're looking for is to make sure – People do need to kind of step back and look at the, you know, I, I believe that 
agriculture in Sonoma County really help form and shape the entire county. Mm -hmm. Whether it's where the development occurs uh, today, uh, if you look at, you know, we, we all pride ourselves on on having city centered growth and and green belts or open space, but that's really because the working farms were there and, and there was efforts made to protect those farms. And I think that we need to uh, double down uh, going forward. I think the opportunity that we have uh, in the near future, uh, updating our general plan, uh, will ha will give us an opportunity to look at what it will take uh, to make sure that agriculture remains viable in the county. And I don't think it's just zoning every piece of property ag, because that a zoning designation alone does not make a business so mm -hmm. uh, if, if ag is not profitable. So what do you do on the value added side? How do you deal with the, uh, whether it's farm stays, tourism, um, those kind of things. People do want to know where their food comes from. Um, and I think that we have a great story to tell. And again, the value uh, of the products here in Sonoma County. So I think there's opportunities there and there's uh, it's a good time to kind of reflect on that and to think, try to think over the horizon a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think the last general plan, we were so adamant about protecting those lands for ag at all costs that now those lands that aren't necessarily uh, can't produce a crop or you know, dairy products and make a profit, having them just be protected for ag is not necessarily producing the ag that we all want. So I think we have to kind of look at those things yeah. going forward. Be careful in how we do it because I think there's uh, right. there could be pratfalls in there, but uh, we need to we need to have a critical open eye. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you bringing up the general plan because we want to have a whole segment on for SoCo Chat just on the general plan. We'd like to invite you back if you're available Love to. to be part of that yeah. discussion because that is going to be a big issue coming up this year as we really want the public to be engaged in the process of that update because it's, what, been nine – 10 years since we updated it? Uh, I think even longer because I know it didn't happen uh, I should on my know watch. Yeah. I, I know I was involved in the one in Petaluma. And I will oh, say that's this, right. It was even before you I will around. say yeah. this about general plans. They are great when they're general. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, I'll be honest, right? Uh, too many times if, if you're thinking of trying to either uh, advocate for a specific project or stop a specific project, it creates a lousy general plan yeah. uh, where you're so focused on – particular use or, or type of uh, project or a particular location. Um, and it's great to, a general plan really is that high level overview of where we see our county going over the next 20 years mm -hmm. or longer. Yeah. Um, and how do we actually get there in terms of our land use regulation? And then below that, you can dive into, you know, on the zoning uh, uh, ordinance uh, for the specifics uh, that deal with each and every property or uh, also, and I, I should say not or, uh, dealing with specific plans, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and in in certain areas where it doesn't make sense in this, especially in this county, to have a broad brush as, approach that thinks you're going to cover all mm -hmm. aspects everywhere, is uh, to really kind of hone in on uh, certain areas about what we want to see in that area or what we think uh, would be applicable uh, to improving the quality of life for people within that area going mm -hmm. forward mm -hmm. and how we work on that. So I'm excited to to go on that yeah. down that path. But it'll be a it'll be a, a little bit of a long road. Yeah. Well, you talk about opportunities for community engagement, you know, and if people want to be involved, this is the time to do it because this is the blueprint for where the county is going. And this yep. is the, the, all those high level conversations. This is the time to do it. So yep. it's always called the land use constitution. So there you go. The yeah. Constitution is a good way to put it. Well, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, I, I do want to talk about another issue. Obviously, another big issue facing the county is housing. And specifically, we have an issue, uh, a threat of losing some housing. We have um, with the support services for young adults through uh, Social Advocates for Youth, which is a, a critical nonprofit that served our our youth and our community or the transitional youth, the ones who are just come out of foster care where so often they kind of fall off the cliff and disappear. Say has been there to really support them in that transition and not just provide housing, but provide support services so they can be ready to uh, to move out uh, on their own. And, and But Say is now making a last-ditch effort to raise at least a million dollars, maybe more, to stay afloat. And if they're not successful, we're at risk of putting 67 young adults uh, on the street. And um, and I know the county's been very involved in that. You've been involved in that. What is the county's uh, perspective on this issue in terms of supporting Say and the people in their care? Yeah, so really what's happening at Say is um – it has is rough, and, and there's many causes behind that, as we as we both know. Um, the county's 
perspective and, and rightfully yeah. so, I think, is to make sure that we address the needs yeah. of the 67 youth that are in care or in Say's uh, realm mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that they can be housed and get the services they need. That's first and foremost, I think, uh, beyond um, anything else. Talking about the future of what's the organization of Say, uh, you're right. Um, I think th um, they provided really stellar um, uh, services to our youth, uh, very important services to our youth. Um, and I think that this year, I don't know if they're going to be the the last of the nonprofits to struggle. Yeah. And I think a part of that is a, a combination of many things, like most things are. Um, inflation overall, mm -hmm. the cost of doing business has gone up. Wage mm -hmm. inflation mm -hmm. has significantly gone up, mm -hmm. um, and it's harder to compete. I do think that, you know, we are fortunate in this county to have a, a lot of wonderful nonprofits, but we're not really a huge county. And uh, the pool of uh, donors is it's kind of the same pool mm -hmm. that are, get tapped again and again and again. And then uh, if philanthropy drops off, uh, the nonprofits suffer. Um, and so it's a combination of all of the above. And I think um, we are going to um, start calling together our nonprofits here shortly, um, I think within a couple of weeks, um, and, and have some conversations about what that looks like, what the relationship between the county, which is really a business relationship, contractual one for services, mm -hmm. uh, what that looks like uh, going forward. Um, you know, the administrative costs for nonprofits are typically capped at the state and federal level, not by the county. Yeah. Um, if the county obviously steps up and does more, fewer uh, services are going to be um, offered uh, yeah. or less people are going to be impacted. Or, uh, so what what's the sweet spot in there and how do we deal with that? So I think it's going to be an ongoing conversation and uh, one that we all need to be, again, kind of open and honest with one another about mm -hmm. what are the issues, who's how can we solve it together mm -hmm. um, and, and working with all our, all of our partners within the county, including the cities? Yeah. Yeah. And I know that, that you've been involved in discussions within the county as to what what we can do when and if these they, they have to close shop and to make sure those 67 don't end up on the street. Right. Because the last thing we want to do is right. is is uh, have them there and uh, and then try to try to bring them back in, indoors. So so I know that there, there's optimism there, uh, 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 different services, but but many of those 67 are in different phases of their lives and some are more ready to, to live on independently and and some need the support services as well. And, That's for sure. And again, you know, I go back and, and give credit to all those that are working on yeah. it. And I know that um, we get, we, get near da daily updates on the um, collaboration that has been taking place and uh, really um, just applaud everyone for stepping up and really looking for those solutions. And so, you know, everyone is at a different place in their life. The other thing that's true on the business side of things, everyone is being um, the, their, their circumstances being funded by a different mechanism as well. So there's this kind of using both and aligning them and mm -hmm. making sure that you can move forward uh, with the dollars that are available um, to solve the problem and to make sure that those kids are uh, taken care of. Yeah, um, and doing it in partnership with the cities, as you yeah. mentioned, and that's 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 always key. Yeah, it's 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 there. There are a lot of th we are uh, the county has great big heart, uh, mm -hmm. great big heart, uh, but not all the problems are ours to solve alone. Mm -hmm. We have to do it collaboratively and, and collectively. Um, we do have, um, fortunately, I think the wherewithal to be a great facilitator, but it doesn't necessarily mean we have the ability to write all the checks as yeah. uh, so we don't. And, uh, you know, we, we, our budget is large, but it's mostly passed through dollars as an arm of the state for programs that come out of Washington, DC and Sacramento that we're implementing here locally. Our discretionary dollars are few and far between mm -hmm. and they have to support, you know, a whole breadth of, uh, yeah. you know, services as well, including, um, you know, uh, law enforcement and, and, and other things. So, you know, finding the sweet spot is always the the key. Yeah. Well, there's obviously a lot of work to do. I mean, my observation is having lived in the in the county now for 25, 26 years, you know, th there has been great improvement in terms of the uh, working, the cities and the county working together and addressing issues of housing and homelessness. Um, but it's, it's going to continue to be an issue. We know I that. think it's just, you know, as you know, Paul, it's all about communications. Yes. That's why your shop's here. <laughs> That's so, right. You know, it's communications and making sure that we're talking to each other, not over each other, yeah. not around each other, but uh, really kind of solving uh, 
yeah. identifying the problem, sitting down together and solving it. And working through it. There you go. Well, you and I can't have a conversation without talking about roads. I mean, <laughs> I, I this is always, uh, it's, it's an issue that uh, is always near and dear to my heart. And you have long been a champion of maintaining or, or stepping up our maintenance of county's roads. I'm going to throw a softball at you. Are you satisfied with the progress that the county is making in, in, up in our pavement improvement program? I will say I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we emphasize roads uh, pavement much more, more than we have yeah. in the past. Okay. Uh, but is there, there's always more to do. Yeah. And part of that has to do with the amount of roads that we have here in Sonoma County. And as you know, we have uh, nearly 1,400 miles of roads. And that's one road from here in Sonoma to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. It's an incredible amount of roads for the taxpayers of Sonoma County to care for. Mm -hmm. um, and to put that into kind of comparison, uh, Marin County, for instance, 400 and make sure I get the numbers straight for you. Um, of course, I didn't write it down. That would help. That's okay. No, That's I did. All right. Actually, uh, Marin County is responsible for 420 miles. Napa, 499. Solano. These are unincorporated. Roads. Unincorporated. Yeah. Uh, Marin, 420. Napa, 499. Solano, 591. My own town of Petaluma has 121, mm -hmm. but we have oh, about 1,400. Yeah. That's just an incredible difference. And, you know, at, um, I've, I've long talked about the discrepancy in the gas tax and how it's allocated to cities and counties. Cities is per capita. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how many roads necessarily, but you're, it's based, based upon on population. population. Yeah. And the counties is always based upon a combination of population and road miles. And if you have a lot of road miles and not a lot of population, which half a million is sounds like a lot, but it's not really. Mm -hmm. You know, we get disadvantaged in that regard. And so for years, we didn't spend enough. And we had to dip into our general fund to really make sure that we were going to keep up our roads. And for years there, and in fact, as far as I know, and I'll say this today, I think we're still spending the most discretionary money of any, Cali, uh, any county in California on roads, which is amazing when you think of it. But it, we ha it has resulted in about what, um, I think this summer, alone, or last summer alone, we pay 50 miles, uh, 54 culverts. We allocated 32 million and 10 and a half million from the general fund. But I think we're over 500 miles total, 520 miles of roads uh, being paved in the last, uh, in expending about $185 million over the last 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. And I, I would question if there's any other county How in California has, has done that much. In, in proportion to the size of Sonoma. Well, thank you for offering that perspective. I actually have this discussion often over the holidays at, at, at uh, uh, dinner tables where people com will complain about the roads, and and I'll I'll throw in some perspective. Well, do you realize you know <laughs> the gas tax does not help? Well, it's a sport Sonoma here County. in Sonoma County. It is a sport to complain, to complain yeah, about the roads. And so, you know, and again, that for as much as we, you asked the question, or am I satisfied? We're we're finally getting into the rural residential road categories of which. Before we had made this additional expenditures, we would have never gotten to. So we're, we're into that category, but we still have a long way to go. And it, it comes after decades and decades of really not expending any money on those kind of roads. So, uh, you know, and part of that, too, like many things, uh, a lot of the low-hanging fruit, the roads that were less expensive to pave have been paved. Those roads that are left need to be rebuilt. Um, and what's true, too, is that we, we have so many roads in Sonoma County because of the way that we were developed we are highly parcelized, I was mm -hmm. told. Uh, smaller farms, not yeah. huge. A lot of family farms, which meant there were more roads. Um, but some of those roads actually only serve a few residences. And mm -hmm. then it's a matter of, well, do we pave that road over a road that serves many or that is a connector? And I think you know the answer is, is that you concentrate on those roads that are most used. So there will always be a um, room for sport in the county talking about uh, what roads are paved and not paved. Well, I just want to note, we love those roads, right? <laughs> I mean, we love those two-lane country roads. Yeah. You know, I was yeah. just driving down to Sonoma Valley for an event yesterday and just remind myself what a beautiful place we live. So, yeah. you know, we, we'd rather have them as two-lane unincorporated roads by yeah. and large. I'm no, just going to throw sure. that in there. For sure. Okay. I, one other question I want to ask you. You represent Sonoma County on several regional boards, including the Association of Area Governments, Golden Gate Bridge District, as you mentioned, MTC, Metropolitan Transportation Commission, uh, smart, the smart train. Um, uh, what regional projects do you see that are going to be significant this year? Do you see anything on the horizon that's going to come up in, in that capacity? Yeah, I think on the housing front through ABAG and MTC, there's going to be a housing bond yeah. that's put forward on the November ballot. 
um, that will be, it could be a game changer. Mm -hmm. um, and Sonoma County will benefit uh, to the tune of 300, 350 million mm. uh, over the course of the term of the, uh, of the bond, which could get a lot of uh, affordable housing built mm -hmm. um, going forward. So that'll be interesting to see how that pans out and what the voters' appetite is. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's it's asking the voters to yeah. step up and contribute. Right. I think uh, transportation is um, – it's always important in a, in a metropolitan area and certainly in, up our way. We're it's finally seeing the com completion of all the freeway uh, 101 widening mm -hmm. and really concentrating on the roads like you – the local roads like you mentioned earlier, uh, but also on public transit, which took a huge hit mm -hmm. uh, during the pandemic. Um, and around the Bay Area and is really billions and billions of dollars uh, behind um, or, you know, uh, underfunded because of the lack of uh, ridership. Yeah. Uh, people working remotely. Yeah. Uh, and the impact of the pande yeah. pandemic has, uh, has been huge. Smart uh, continues to lead the way in, in its ridership recovery, which is That's just great. wonderful. Out of the 27 agencies in the Bay Area, Smart has been number one or two. Uh, consistently. That's so fantastic. that's great. And a lot of that is uh, thanks to the great work of the uh, general manager. I think uh, some smart decisions by the, pardon the pun, uh, by uh, staff in terms of being imaginative. Uh, it's not necessarily always the AM, PM commuter uh, mm -hmm. these days, especially with the remote work. It's really trying to attract people onto the train, uh, get them to experience how great it is to travel that way and then travel that way uh, a little more often. Yeah. Uh, I think the first last mile and those issues are still are challenges and that we'll address and the housing opportunities that occur around the stations. I think that a lot of the communities up and down the line uh, are addressing right now and will be in place within, you know, the next two, three, four, five years. So that's a good thing. I'm, at the Golden Gate Bridge, I'm proud of the work that I've, uh, since I've been on the bridge, some pretty significant changes have taken place. We we did all electronic tolling, mm. which was uh, kind yep. of, that was a big Herculean change. act. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I thought I had turned that off. Uh, uh, the all electronic tolling was a Herculean act. And uh, we landed every toll taker was offered a job elsewhere in the district. And it worked out really well. And I think that it's improved the traffic flow. One of these days, you'll see the toll plaza actually removed entirely. Mm -hmm. And uh, traffic will uh, continue to flow that much better. Um, the movable median barrier project that had been talked about forever was installed and that's that concrete divider down the middle. That's it's, terrific. You remember those little, the zipper. Uh, the, the little cones that were placed yeah. every so many <laughs> yards that really did nothing yeah. uh, to, um, you know, prevent uh, head on collisions yeah. on the bridge, which was uh, devastating and deadly. Um, so that's been a great thing. And then uh, lastly, right now we're finishing up the suicide deterrent yeah. net that has yeah. been long coming. And that has, as you know, we've talked about that ever since I started in this business years yeah. ago. And yeah. it's just amazing, uh, uh, you know, the positive impact that that will make. And mm -hmm. many people think that, it, you know, while it will just push people elsewhere, but if you take away that particular opportunity at that particular time, you, one never knows what is going to happen to that yeah. individual. And, right. I think people would be surprised to learn how many times someone is over the rail on the bridge. And could you imagine being a bridge painter or an iron worker oh, and having to deal impact. with that yeah. more than once a week? Oh, it's horrible. Uh, and it uh, salutes, you know, uh, they actually all have particular roles to play in that regard um, and deal with it uh, professionally and uh, empathetically. Um, but that net will be literally, literally a lifesaver. A lifesaver for many uh, people. For many people. Yeah. And then lastly, um, we, we were very uh, pleased to receive $400 million from the federal government and the large bridge projects because we're going to be moving into the last phase of the seismic upgrade of the main span, hmm. which is about a billion-dollar project. This is still uh, on the Golden Gate Bridge. Still on the Golden yeah. Gate Bridge. So lots, yeah. of, lots, lots of work of at the bridge. Going. And, you know, in each one of those uh, regional boards and positions, are, I tend to kind of find myself in leadership positions, which is both uh, – it's good – uh, to make sure that we're engaged locally and right. that we have a voice in what ha what happens. But it's also great to be on the leadership side of things because you're that much more engaged. You can drive some of that work. You can make sure that Sonoma County is a, is a beneficiary yeah. of the projects that are out there. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to, I'm proud to be involved in all of those uh, different projects. Well, thank you for that update, David. We always have more things to talk about than we have time. <laughs> 
But I really uh, appreciate you uh, for joining us. As a thank you for being our guest, we'd like to give you one of our SoCo yes. checks. <laughs> yes. I you'll, told you, this you'll is why be, I'm here. You'll be the talk of your <laughs> block. Uh, yes. And uh, we'd also like to invite you, of course, to come back and talk about more of these issues and other ones that are that are coming up in this year. Yeah, so. no, I, I would love to come back. And I think, it, again, it's um, kudos to you and your, your staff for um, – putting the studio in place and, and having this opportunity. And I think it's a great way to communicate uh, with the public, with our own staff, um, with each other, and to make sure that the, these issues continue to be talked about. Um, so many times everything's a soundbite or you never get really in depth. Yeah. Uh, here's an opportunity to really kind of get in on some subjects and uh, all the good stuff that is going on in the county, the challenges and the opportunities. Yeah. Well, thank you for getting us off on, a, on the right foot. Thanks, so. Paul.